Hello everyone, today we talk about late medieval Scottish military organization, uh, observing really an outline, uh, in fact, the, the structure of Scottish armies, and adding something about the political and social context of the country. We already made some videos about Scottish warfare here and there, even something parallel properly to these times, I think specifically a video on uh, the 14th century Scottish pikemen, right? So talking about some of the uh, mass protagonists of the uh, Scottish uh, wars of independence on, on the battlefield. And as we will see, this were fundamentally the, uh, the, the, the most important arm, at least um, in, uh, in numerical terms in the uh, Scottish armies of the time. Here, of course, the whole pattern of interpretation is that Scotland was a less resourceful country compared to, to England, was also less uh, feudal in nature. Naturally, um, you know, the, mm, this, uh, these are the centuries, the 14th to 15th, in which uh, Scottish monarchy, the Kingdom of Scotland, properly consolidates uh, towards an ever more uh, centralized direction. Um, but always maintaining that kind of, you know, uh, of, of a wild character, we could say, because Scotland is not a civilized country, and, and I mean it in, in a positive sense, the intent that the astonishing beauty of Scottish warfare derives, also in much later times, as you know, the, 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 the uh, reminiscence of, a, you know, an older tradition that still looked at cold steel in an age of muskets, etc. Think about Cologne Moor, etc. Uh, but that's yet another thing. And 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 um, this makes actually even um, the country ever more remarkable um, in European history per se, right? Because unlike Ireland specifically, it had, in fact, was, was in between a bit with the uh, with uh, the English market, because the, the, the continentally modeled ones uh, in, the, in the creation properly of a, of a real state, uh, and also of a consistent military um, that was able, in fact, to win the same Scottish independence. And we will talk uh, about Scottish tactics at some point. This is just about the army organization, but we never made videos about, if not, uh, we made a video about the Battle of Stirling Bridge. If you're interested, we'll talk about um, about these things there. Uh, specifically, Scotland was one of the uh, uh, protagonists in the um, early 14th century infantry victories over heavy cavalry, we could say. The Scottish armies obviously had cavalry on their own, but prevalently um, having, in fact, less structured resources, less concentrated you know, uh, land assets compared least to, to a country like England, it could serve less. So infantry was particularly important for that reason. And the, the important moral force of the Scottish infantry is in battles like, uh, you know, Bannockburn, like we can see um, uh, throughout all the war, you know, e even later times. So this is not something that the Scots kind of abandoned. Uh, that was, in fact, due to their political and social organization, so we can't say it even beyond, um, is, it is an example, illustrates um, the, uh, as an example these, this, this important chapter in European history. Albeit, as we will see, from the mid-14th century, also Scottish warfare would uh, refeudalize uh, um, further, uh, in a way. And Scot Scotland never had had a full feudalism up, up to this point, strictly made. Uh, in moments of emergencies, uh, there, were, there was a conscription system, a fourth one introduced by William Wallace after the Battle of Stirling Bridge, in fact, in 1297, uh, that involved properly registers of those liable for service. There were even gallows uh, to quickly make an example of those who failed to answer the, the call to arms. Um, this system, however, had a short life because it was connected properly to, to the important military effort of the period. So what uh, came back on the fore after uh, Wallace's fall from power was this um, old combination of the uh, so-called uh, Scottish service, the Servitium Scoticarum, also known as Communis Exercitus, so common army, um, and the feudal obligations that uh, were, you know, based on 
and that actually blend in with also with the Scottish service because you you could hardly distinguish at some levels, you know, the uh, you know the dynamic that would bring a certain uh, you know uh, a Scotman in the first place to just join the common army and the one that was done because of you know the 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 authority of the local aristocracy and so um, this is an aspect that in fact is usually as if you know as if these two systems were something rigidly separated actually they were not and that's why in fact why the conscription system introduced by Wallace was something relatively innovative because it was going beyond this uh, this dimension because you know what's the difference between conscription and levy right levy is is a conscription fundamentally it's just that this was done in an extra way um beyond the the customs let's say of the land that uh, as far as i understand probably had you know had already regulated in some in some form documentarily at some point uh, administratively the differences surely between the feudal service and the let's say this broader uh, Freeman levy that is of, as you understand, also much older times. But still, the the private connections had always been there historically and cannot really be eliminated so so easily. So the communis exercitus, the servitium scoticarum, was properly a, a levy of all able-bodied freemen aged between sixteen and sixty years old, um, which, uh, as you understand, was never like at, at the fullest, right? No country uh, could uh, or would have the reason for in the first place to mobilize the, the entire population, right, for military expeditions. In medieval times, especially, the, the coercive, uh, coercion power was really limited. So uh, what this meant is that in theory, er everybody that could be taken it with, again, means that were you know, public as private, as you understand, based on force, but also at some point, of course, on um, individual commitment, because, uh, you know, the people also understood, uh, of course, the broader uh, international situation that would have a local interest to, you know, to, to even fight properly for, for their freedom, etc. To, to join, right, so whoever would, would had to do it, right, and, and naturally this was complicated, as you know, in Scotland by the uh, up to this point to a lack of a real central authority or properly a, of a I fully institutionalized monarchy and as the, the various clans would most often take in fact different directions um, much of the Scottish War of Independence as always is, was also kind of a Scottish civil war as most medieval wars always were uh, by a, a certain degree um, and this common army uh, system survived um, I presume I, I don't know historically when you can't say it, it formally was was abolished but at least you know uh, mm, let's say after the late 14th century you, you don't really find it much anymore for reasons that we will explain now because juridically speaking this was the universal military levy that you could find from Romano-Germanic or even Celtic um, times uh, literally everywhere, all over Europe, right? Um, and most countries at this point had surpassed it in the sense that uh, the professionalization of warfare and some more elaborated forms of recruitment, let's say, uh, were, were, were enacted. Uh, the, but, let's say, the, the juridical principle was, of course, that every uh, subject as a free man would... Uh, but had to participate to the army. It was, it was a right uh, be, and a privilege and a honor rather than just a duty. Of course, some, m most people at that time wouldn't consider it like that, but still the idea that you could be a free man in arms that, had the, uh, that, that, could, uh, that would be recognized as, as such, also because he could participate to the army in the first place, um, was... Um, was at this point right, was was a prerogative a bit of all you know of all the the populations in Western Europe uh, at this point. What happens in the second half of the 14th century is that uh, after the the great growth 
of medieval civilization. There is the, the Black Death and all these things. And so the demographic and economic contraction brings the uh, the lower classes to to say, okay, uh, that's it, right? We, we, we prefer rather to, to be under uh, powerful noblemen than, than risking our lives in war because we have... We, we barely survive even on, on our own out there. And generally speaking, this was in part consensual, in part, of course, it was the same nobility that managed to take over mills really properly, that this, even that these communities in the first place and controlling them. Um, and again, as I was saying before, even before this time, the, the difference is relatively blurred. It, it, depend, it depended on how you know strong the, the local communities were how you know powerful the, the elites were this is typical of northern europe in general we have seen it even in the recent videos about scandinavia that uh you know the the existence of a free uh peasantry that you know that the, the elite would have more difficulty to control uh, and to you know to, to build a state on it in fact it's not actually a just even a proof of particular development on the contrary right all the most developed countries were were far beyond the situation it was rather based on the scarcity local scarcity of resources and the primitiveness of the system that as we will see in fact also in scotland is quite you know quite prominently uh, evident um we um we have a parliamentary edict of 1481 that tells us that the uh, servitium scoticarum was so was, was still present but not so usual anymore was expected on eight days notice right and that those who assembled were expressly warned against despoiling the countryside by the way which is yet another thing that often happened in medieval armies usually th this was uh, this this warning was issued when the army was already summoned and you know it would go across the country from a place to another and the soldiers were you know were were you know told not to ravage their own country it often it happened here <laughs> instead you know in scotland you have it again a bit wilder you know the, the the point was you know don't don't raid your own country while you're actually even um mastering for the the general army in the first place and this tells you pretty much what what the context was in general and we are at the end of the middle ages by the way um speaking of the scottish army organic we i don't think we have explicit information but indirect one from which we realized that units of 5, 10, 100, 500, and 1,000 were, were there. This is, um, you know, it was probably included in this subdivisions, both cavalry and infantry, um, as well as missile troops. Um, I presume not just, you know, an organic for, for the infantry, for example, even though the latter would be numerically, as we will see now, the most prominent um, element of the Scottish armies. Uh, the feudal element was, that is a big word for Scotland, but still maybe not so much, you know, people have uh, difficulties of saying, uh, you know, talking about feudalism in general, but uh, we often forget that independently on the, the institutionalization of the feudal system, the clientary system was at the basis of any single community at that time, so uh, whether we want to call it feudal or not, because Scotland took more time to develop that in a more f formally institutionalized way it doesn't really matter but um when it was issued by 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 the monarchy of course and so by still a public system that was you know still based on this uh you know the pre-existing customs had to negotiate the the uh nobiliar military service in this case. Uh, this was um, in Scotland first supplied on the usual 40-day basis that as you know was by the by the 12th century already a bit the standard for you know, countries like France, England. Uh, albeit by the second half of the 14th century the, uh, the system had properly changed or at least had evolved in, uh, into a direct money contract, uh, very similar to the one of the English indentures, uh, as a matter of fact, with, with, uh, with um, these um, uh, uh, contracts called bands or bonds of retinue proper, that were mm, really widespread and that 
simply reflect that at this point, even just the, the changes that had occurred in the centuries, the greater uh, you know, monetization of the market, the greater professionalization of the market, as we've seen, the, uh, a more uh, you know, subjugated population that would maintain a more powerful elite, and therefore an elite that could also, that also had the means to so in the vast of the monarchy to, to literally pay whoever would come to offer that service. And so it was done on, a, um, on an occasional base, in a way. And in fact, the English did the same. You know, during the, the Hundred Years' War, the Indian Turk worked like this. They, they were private contract. Of course, these, the, the contractors were, were still in, involved in the political institutional system because they were often the same noblemen who, uh, you know, treated war, of course, as a business. Um, and uh, therefore, that there was kind of a better way to fight at the time, given that also warfare was becoming ever more expensive in relative terms with new, you know, heavier armor, firearms, um, you know, greater costs that the individuals also at that point could not really afford. Um, uh, to to compete with in the first place in Scotland you do find especially in the Highlands etc this kind of heroic warfare remaining sometimes with astonishing uh, you know uh, technological backwardness but compensated by an equally astonishing moral and uh, physical capacity uh, we made a video uh, about this as well we will keep talking about that at some point and the the things were mixed in because of course Scotland uh, in fact is is a diverse country you have the lowlands you have the highlands you you so there were probably even different models of of of, uh, of business entrepreneurial in, in warfare itself but um still we're talking about the same country so people from these backgrounds would often join in the same ways um, and there weren't really many other ways to, to, to do so. So the, prof the professionalism had increased, obviously, by, by the, the second half of the 14th century, also in Scotland. We have an example from 1372 of the Earl of Douglas retaining Sir James Douglas of Dalkeith to serve him with eight men-at-arms and 16 archers. As you will see now, the this is a bit of a old British think the idea of having men at arms uh, and, and and a consistent amount of archers and immediately here you realize if you look at the English indenture normally the, the archers were in a much greater proportion than men at arms here I mean it's just a random example but it could still mirror a systemic a difference with, uh, that uh, that we'll see now that, that is the Scots made use of course of archery in an important fashion but but mm, proportionally and and also absolutely uh, in less numbers than the english meaning that the men at arms were kind of more important and as we'll see here mm, probably that the whole package here was mounted meaning that uh, the, the scots did fight dismounted as well as the english sometimes not always though it's um, we have often for the English as well presumed that that was kind of a standard mode but it was also dictated by of course by the strategic and or I mean the, the tactical contingencies um, and in any case especially in, in frontier warfare most of these um, units were, were properly mounted and also were quite rapid and swift and you know they were logistically very very uh, skilled capable of living with very few and therefore also moving however fast or with less encumbrant um, apparatuses with them. And a statute of arms of 1318 states that every um, Scottish layman possessing 10 pounds in goods should have at least an acuton, so a padded armor, a helmet and gauntlets or at uh, somewhat greater expense a coat of plates and male corslet. It's interesting that I also, you know, plate armor at this point was was there, but still, it's contemplated already by default by 1318, right? Um, so these were the, of course, the the more the more affluent individuals. The uh, so-called small folk, only possessing goods uh, evaluated at one cow, 
were to have just quote a good spear or a good bow and uh, so you understand that infantry here has an important missile uh, element as well because um, yes spear and, and bow here are given as an alternative for, for one another but still the presence of of, of bowmen here he is uh, considering the the, the average Western European uh, armament probably in, present in greater number, right? And it's not even a particularly positive thing, right? Uh, having a spearman is better than having a bowman in, uh, in 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 general, right? It depends what these people were, right? People who had just a cow surely were not those who would uh, train uh, dramatically as military professionals right you could argue that of course they lived in in the wilderness they had they had a good you know capacity of using a bow but one thing is you know training like a real athlete like you know the the english were were boosting incentivating properly as even sporting activities uh, to to s kind of socially engineer the, this military training among the the lower classes so mm, every Scotman on average at this point knew how to use well a bow um, and it's also possible that however you know you understand that the alternative between a spear and a bow means also material cost right so th that tells you generally speaking the poverty of, of the context and so that is primarily an indicator that tells you that yeah th this is just mi low quality militia by a certain degree um, but uh, of course then eventually how this would uh, be motivated or you know framed or in in a military context is a different thing as the, the wars of scottish independence proved as well uh there's another statue t dating to 1429 that indicates how a uh, scottish yeoman with 20 pounds in goods should have quote a doubled a doublet of fence so it's not a it's another padded armor helmet sword buckler and bow mm -hmm. um, which um, adds the bow by the way to the um, if you could to, to the panoply here as the 1318 statute doesn't actually talk about um, swords or buckler right it just speaks of armor fundamentally um, it 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 may be that by by the early 15th century to the to the more affluent element uh, here we talk about the yeomanry would be required kind of a more complex panoply maybe than in previous times um, can speak generally speaking of that enrichment of maybe the the slightly you know uh, above uh, superior class let's say. Um, by the later Middle Ages, uh, greater availability at this point of, uh, I mean, a sword at this point costed much less than it had costed, uh, you know, one century before, all right? And this list speaks of, essentially, of, of a sort of light infantry, right? Because double of fence here is meant to have as padded armor, as far as I understand. A helmet at this point also would be something relatively, I mean, cheap in, in the first place. Uh, this ward also would be relatively cheap as we have seen a buckler so not really you know a heavy encumbered shield or whatever and a bow right so um, uh, somewhat um, you can't, we can't talk about light infantry to core because of course these troops probably would engage normally into hand-to-hand -hand combat it was standard ground but still this this it's a relatively especially armor here we don't, we don't see much of it as a requirement it, differently from the 1318 statute which, which is fascinating um, which could mean that at this point Scottish warfare had become a bit more uh, articulated dynamic specialized so that it relied more on combined arms than it was like at the beginning of the 14th century where it was mostly about this bulk of you know of, of uh, mostly of infantry had to stand against uh, the enemy cavalry charges and so on um, and so, and with this important missile element as well, right? Which, again, the the, the thirteen eighteen statute doesn't um, actually speak of uh, 
of both for this higher you know uh, stratum of, of 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 the troops just for the the, the least equipped ones but it's still meaningful that at uh, this point that missile power was required also to the heavier element of, of the mass. Um, for the 1429 statutes we do not have instead the, the, the issue uh, panoply for the lesser uh, you know for, for the less affluent individuals they probably provided the, the, the spearman and or maybe still the bowman by the way because the idea is that the, the bowman if you date back this, the, the if you look in in perspective, historical chronological perspective, these um, laws of recruitment in Europe, normally at the very beginning, like in the migration era, the 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 lowest, you know, the poorest element of society had to provide just a bow, right, a quiver. Sometimes they say the the sources actually say, um, so that speaks of the attitude. You know, the, most people were also hunters in a sense, they, they live like that, but they were considered the, the lowest quality of all the troops, right? So, um, of course, if you have a spearman, you're supposed for him to, to hold the ground at some level, whereas a bowman, really not. So in the 1318 statute, that, that's the difference that, uh, that is important to stress, that still, you know, there, that alternative between spear and bow does correspond to the one between kind of a heavily, it doesn't matter how light in relative terms, but still somebody who can hold the ground. Infantry and missile infantry is somebody that cannot hold the ground. Um, so uh, men at arms of throughout all this period would have been equipped basically identically to their English counterparts, though perhaps uh, somewhat less thoroughly. This is the other idea. Yes, that you if you look at the the wilder interland of Scotland, the Highlands, etc., you realize that um, there simply was less uh, wealth available in the first place, and so the idea is that the Celtic fringe maintained always a lesser degree of armoredness compared to the English, and it's absolutely correct. It is something you can find, in fact, also in Ireland, uh, and. Um, that would be compensated with different types of tactics that were mostly naturally more relying on guerrilla at that point. But in the case of the elite, especially as we know, with this double-handed swordsman that would, you know, have even a relatively light equipment like an Akaton or anything, maybe very poor metal armor, but still were trained to to go, kind of almost berserker into the into the midst of the fray and and chop to pieces whatever they found which um, was scary even for those who, you know, who, who could have a, a better armor in the first place. Uh, naturally, these people came also from, from areas that were less politically relevant in the other day, so that's the way they compensated for that greater threat and instability that existed in their own, in their own community. Um, so uh, there were some inspections of the, but for I mean, for the rest, I mean, the the equipment of of a Scottish man at arm uh, is indistinguishable from from any other other Western one. The degree is just you know of how uh, much quality was it, whether there were some pieces missing, right? This is something you find even in other areas like I don't know the Balkans, or that, that maybe you find somebody who bought uh, I don't know Milanese armor just uh, for the torso, not for the legs, right? So they, they kind of economize because at the end of the day that, that is going to eventually change the way you fight. That is, properly, if you, if, if there is that um, scarcity of material wealth, still your military system will adapt towards something lighter and kind of more, uh, you know, that, that can cope to against a he more heavily armored uh, foe. And still, you know, less armor means still more speed, and so you can invest in that um, and uh, and change tactics accordingly. But uh, for the rest, of course, uh, many, uh, Scot uh, presumably most Scottish noblemen had their own full Western panoply without any, you know, substantial difference. This is truer the more you go on, right? C certain archaisms. Yes, you could find, I don't know, at the beginning of the 14th century, who knows how, um, 
but generally speaking the elite could always afford in, in, in battle also because the, the, the armor within in its within its completeness still has a uh, in fact uh, a unitary function so yes there were maybe these missing pieces or something like that but that was kind of a maybe I presume an exception still uh, there were inspections of the individuals requisite arms horses and so on that uh, took place at uh, events called uh, weapon shows uh, which I presume comes from the Germanic etymology of the Divap and the, the um, show, like properly showing your 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 weapons if you want or your colors in the first place. Um, that uh, in the 1429 statutes is issued to be held four times a year in each district of the kingdom. Um, as it seems that the as the, the contemporary King James I had revived this custom for uh, albeit the 1318 statute specifies that such checks uh, were to be held only once a year after Easter right, which presumably also speaks of the uh, in general of, of, for Easter of the seasonalism still of of warfare in a way the idea that you know still in spring that this but open to there is eastern that you go at war fundamentally um after the, the purification that that's the, the and yes you know in a country like scotland especially you know the seasonal warfare probably lasted longer you know even just in even as a as a mindset than than in other more you know modernized countries um what um sources stress uh, especially as frontier warfare is concerned is the uh, remarkable mobility of scottish forces uh, as virtually their entire army would be mounted now this is true for again mostly frontier warfare because they uh, of course relied of course on speed for the raids um, the loot and so on. Uh, whereas, if we of course talk about Scottish armies in you know pitch battles and so on, the, the thing would require much heavier structured logistics and so on. So it's a very different thing. If you read this, don't think that Scottish armies were just mounted per se. It's, it's a bit just like the the English um, chevauchee. After all, they, they were considered conceived strategically to to be uh, very you know swift moves across the map, and you know mostly they. Um, most of these elements would be mounted, even the same bowmen, uh, aside from from the men at arms, that of course preferred to fight dismounted, also because often they were outnumbered, and that that was the actual thing that we often don't remember enough. Also about the Hundred Year War uh, English tactics, um, but that for these other operations were quite conveniently uh, mounted, right? In guerrilla skirmishes, raids. Exp uh, you know, explorations and so on, they, th there would be a, an important advantage. Now, the, of course, the, the, the ground in the Scottish in English frontier is also pretty rough, so these horses, as we will see, were quite, you know, they, they, they were quite considered as they could, quote, get over where our footmen could scarce dare to follow, right? So, as an English source of the 16th century puts it and um, the Scots fed off the land right the, remember the, the statute before ask please not to ravage the country while they were even just mastering well this was their daily habit also the, the Scottish clans would always be kind of more or less in that state of turmoil um, and um, the Scottish uh, the only Scottish supplies in this context being quote a broad flat stone and little sack full of oatmeal according to Froissart that however quotes uh, the Hainalter uh, Jean de Belle uh, and with which they they would bake a sort of biscuit to hear their quote sodden meat as Froissart calls it and interestingly enough, they they boiled the meat in a cauldron made from the skin of the same slaughtered animal, as so to avoid the need for for cumbersome cooking equipment with them. 
it's, it's quite fascinating. And um, also the horses were similarly fended for themselves. Um, Frasar again describes how the, uh, the 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 commonality neither tied up nor curried their hackneys, but simply turned them out quote to graze the first heat or meadow that presents itself whenever they make a halt. And this is interesting, indeed, because of course this would confer some some speed advantage for the operations. It's not much that cavalry in itself is is speedier than infantry on the longer run. Um, but uh, of course, much of this depends also properly on the supplies, right? So these were, you know, Scottish men were rough, right? So they, they were a bit weighted to leave in greater discomfort, uh, with greater, you know, knowing how to to survive out there without too too much uh, luxuries, um, and so they declined this this capacity for. You know, saving in this sense of, as you understand, it's a poor war, it's a frontier war at the end of the day. But it's effective because it probably did really confer them an important strategical advantage. Of course, at, at, at some point they would bring supplies with them. Of course, at some point they had some cooking e equipment with them, right? And the larger the, the contingent, the, the, mm, the more uh, this is the case. It's just that. How do you even stop these? I mean, it's um, with the problem of the front of frontiers. It's not much, you know. You you can't cope with uh, individual raids that easily, right? If it's a larger one, you can more easily intercept it or ha properly having the the reason for doing it. If it's something, also, just it's an unstable situation. You have to cope with, uh, you know, even you have to leave it to the local garrisons to, to, to you know, that are going to individually. Uh, you know, have to, that are out there on their own. They have to cope with whatever threat ar arrives to them. At least first, then then a relief army. Uh, and so, in general, you know, the Scottish raids were also quite ferocious, and that, albeit the English didn't have much of, of a great opinion of the Scots, still, um, you know, in vri writing quite uh, propagandistic stuff. But you know, those atrocities were not really distant from from the truth as much as. You know the English ones uh, had could be in Scotland indeed, and so this is the the kind of background that people were were used to. Um, so in a more international sense, as we we well know, Scotland was allied to France throughout the the Hundred Years' War, um, and uh, the France's support to Scotland was a principal factor in the outbreak of war in 1337. Uh, in the first place, uh, this was uh, also an older game than this in the previous um, centuries, and and there were often in this of you know state of civil war um, many Scottish troops, often exiles, in fact, serving on the continent from the very beginning of hostilities. Um, this is absolutely normal if you look at what the market of war was at the time. We will see now how. Uh, Scottish armies were were not just present in France, but even at home could uh, I mean received help from from the same France, but as also fr from other countries, even across the scenes, Scandinavia specifically. So, um, in um, in if if there is something to earn, uh, people will come from everywhere, right? There are the myth that people in the Middle Ages had. You know this dramatic impediment in traveling is is, is very well debunked, if you, especially if you study mercenary history in the first place. Um, and um, there were also, in fact, Fra important French contingents serving in Scotland. For example, uh, the exp the 1385 expedition under Jean de Vienne. At this point, the French uh, contingent. Counted 26 banneret, 50 knights, and 1050 men at arms. Frassar says 1000 men at arms, if not more, and 500 crossbowmen plus pages, etc. So the, the French here are mustering an important force, they're able to send uh, overseas to support the Scots. And it's a quite consistent one. Here we're talking properly about men at arms, which I don't know here if it, what they mean because usually men at arms are. Um, properly, the 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 knights, right? The the, the heavy 
heavy troops. Um, and the knights are naturally counted here as properly the, I think, those who had been dubbed as such, right? So, but I think that the contingent, as we were saying before, professionalism increased. So these people might have actually been an, an imposing force of ten, uh, of more than one thousand heavy infantrymen, probably, and and with this, if you want modest also missile element plus the retinues and so on, which was an important one. From their side instead, and this comparison is, is eloquent, the Scots could muster, quote, no more than a thousand lances and about 30,000 other men, all badly armed for the same campaign, sources say. So, um, so a thousand lances, you know, that the lances here we are in the second half of, of, of the 14th century, at this point was was considered as a, as a tactical unit proper, a bit like the page has mentioned before. I mean, the idea that for a, a lance that was essentially a man at arm and some some retinue in the form of properly of so, so some kind of fighting element. But in my experience, even though it's mostly concentrated in the first half of the 14th century, when you read this number of lances, especially in an army, when you see 1,000 lances and 30,000 other men, so it's a pretty large army. You know, it would be the the entire Scottish force at that point, uh, concretely. So, uh, or at least one would be normally levied in a in a big expedition from from the kingdom. Uh, that thousand lances actually corresponds to just one thousand men at arms, right? And maybe even even if, of course, if they had a retinue of some sort, maybe this is counted in the thirty thousand other men. Properly, and so the lengths doesn't actually count the um, the uh, maybe much of another retinue. Otherwise, it could be simply yes, maybe three thousand of those forces pl plus other thirty thousand men. It's it's possible. It's just that the heavy element, however, tends properly to to overlap with the number of the lengths itself, as, as the lengths organization properly was meant to be. Um, but what what is fascinating is that the source stresses that that all this army was badly armed and um, which naturally in all wars can happen for you know rarely things are you know perfect and uh, wars are fought always in some condition of you know of emergency and and um, and you know risk and difficulty properly to, to mobilize forces and political and social and so on um, but it, this may be a French ap appreciation of the Scottish, uh, say, roughness and their lack of, of means in, in a broad sense. Uh, we have other foreigners in Scottish service, as we were saying before, during the 14th century, such as Swedes, Danes, Norwegians, such as the ones who uh, served in King David II's army during his uh, uh, plundering into England in 1341. And this is also interesting because it will, uh, now we will t talk about also the relation between Scotland and the Western Isles. Um, but it, it, it's very revealing of how people from Scandinavia would go serve in Scottish army at this point for some you know, for some revenue, and this also tells you what was the situation in the Scandinavian kingdoms uh, at the time itself to go search for a service in for a country like Scotland. It was definitely maybe not not the really the the most the the best payer um, uh, in general. And this this was a time in which the Scandinavian kingdoms had problems on their own with German mercenaries actually taking over their own countries. Uh, literally, and and so uh, as we have seen in the videos about medieval Scandinavia, and the mm, mm, therefore we're talking about very rough backgrounds. Of course, they're, they're also scarcely documented um, on average. So we just get these mentions, and we can, however, just imagine how it could be. And so the first thing that comes in your mind, I guess, is is you know, th that the Viking era was not over, in a sense, because this pouring out of other, you know, uh, people searching for, who were these people, right? You think uh, a nice, uh, you know, you know, Pacific gentleman who decided romantically to serve in Scotland. These people were just, they were, they were mercenaries, they were pirates, they were, you know, who knows what. 
and they would find this chance to not properly even probably they, they wouldn't even expect much of a pay but just you know to participate to the uh, to the to the plundering in um, in England by the way so speaking of the Isles and Western seaboard of Scotland that um, as you know um, were quite characteristic they had uh, some sort of um, Norse uh, character still also in military uh, tradition per se they retained this kind of, of course, necessarily a novel connection with the surrounding countries and they had uh, some, some, some relevance at this point. They, uh, they remained autonomous under the Lord or, or King of the Isles and, um, until as late as 1493, right? Uh, uh, you know, probably some in, in, in strained relations with Scotland, with whom in part, as we'll see now, where allies in part were, you know, antagonizing uh, to say the least um, in 1493 in fact the last lord was executed and um, in in the 90s uh, in the 1390s and the 1400s uh, the, the 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 isles had s signed some treaties with england that recognized uh, them as a, as a sovereign state independent of scotland uh, in any case the isle meant Traditionally, did supply uh, troops to the to, to most Scottish armies throughout the, this era, right? We know of contingents from Argyll, Kintyre, and the Isles proper appearing, for example, in in Robert Bruce's division at Bannockburn, which also speaks of the you know on the reliance, in fact, that the Scottish uh, monarchs. Uh, made on, on on the Isles as a military force and the, the important political closeness. Frassart records Isle men in the army mustered for the 1346 uh, Scottish campaign. As he says, quote, Thither came the earls, barons, and prelates of Scotland, and there they agreed that they should enter England with all possible speed. They desired that John of the Isles, should be in the expedition for he governed the wild scots that is here the highlanders so in, um, in um, mainland scotland who would obey him and no other man so which speaks of the political connection between the highlanders and the islemen so at this point it's properly something else from the you know from the scottish kingdom it mostly was a um, kind of a lowland thing and uh, and also heavily uh, influenced by by the south uh, historic and um, and then the quotes goes on it says he came with three uh, so John with three thousand of the most outrageous people in all the country which also speaks for what these men actually were about and so their 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 roughness their warlikeness their primitiveness but also their effectiveness as 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 the same quote says, as they had properly been called, and as also they, they, the islemen had uh, political leverage on the the highlands that technically were uh, were part of the Scottish kingdom, rather as the the same isles <laughs> would have to be in the first place. But this tells you how loose that control was in general on this territory, um, and. Uh, as you understand, as we were saying before, the Isles were retaining some maritime activity and sea power, but frankly, at, at this point, it was quite modest. And we have just, if, if we accept to aid for the uh, Battle of Bloody Bay, basically there is no other major, you know, show of of sea power of the Islemen. But aside from from the, the mansions, of course, the, the the Scottish crown did consider um, in this period at some some point, like as the 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 Isle Man as a potential threat, right? Um, the um, regarding the size of of their ships, often referred to as Heeland galleys in later sources, in 1354, the o the Lord of the Isles authorized John MacDougall of Lorne to 
build eight ships, each of 12 or 16 oars, which is a modest force, telling the truth. While at the very end, this period in 1498, the Lord of Dunvegan was expected to maintain two 16 oar ships and one 26 oar ship for Roy Scottish royal service. Right? And um, crews, because Scot Scotland had a navy on its own, as a matter of fact, and this had also to, you know, uh, thanks to the contribution of the island. The crews appear to have been reckoned at three men per oar in war time, so that a 16 oar ship basically would, would have a complement of 96 men to make the mats. But as you understand, in, in the broader uh, military economy of Scotland, say, it was um, this power was not, it's, it's not documented to have accounted for a dramatic power of, of any sort by Travis Spear. Speaking of artillery, which is, you would expect, ah, now it's the same old story, Schwerpunk, you want to say the Scots were poor and, and, and all this stuff. Well, um, there is something to it, of course, but um, it's also a mistake to consider that just because a country was less resourceful, it would necessarily uh, so, you know, the arrival of, or spread of technology later than others. In my experience, medieval warfare, what I've seen, is, especially by this time, in the later Middle Ages, technology has spread basically immediately everywhere. Uh, in Western Europe, as, as, as soon as, but, uh, as you, you, you find them in one country, you know that basically in the same years they are everywhere. Our problem, again, is documentation. And it's obvious that where the, there was less material availability, also even less written recordings and so on, you encounter these uh, mentions more rarely and uh, statistically later as a consequence, but uh, this that has nothing to do with the actual acknowledgement uh, of these uh, technologies in the first place. So you, you may find written that the Scots first saw artillery in 1327 uh, when they faced uh, Edward III's uh, the, uh, of England army. Uh, and again, during the English siege of Berwick in 1333. Uh, but it's it's an approximation. Of course, the Scots knew firepower before that. However, the first mention of a Scottish uh, cannon in use by, you know, national use, let's say, was in 1339 at the siege of Stirling. Um, and as it's understandable also for the logistical reflections we made before, uh, artillery was quite rarely used in the uh, Scottish raids in England, right? But also in the larger armies that crossed the border. Um, albeit, we know that by the mid-15th century, mm, Scottish noblemen uh, often had uh, already their own guns. Uh, use and this would be normal. Every Frenchman would invest in part that that point. Let's say it's by the twenties of the fifteenth century that any mm, updated um, European prince would have some guns on on his own, right? So uh, we can imagine, you know, modest guns, relatively modest guns, depending on on the power uh, of the clan, but still useful against all those, you know, uh, uh, Scottish castles that we can romantically admire still today uh, and, and in fact w was a big deal but however still a, a big cost so this is part of the of course of the way that the state began gradually to erode even feudal power uh, by by force of arms with something that could crush now more easily um, a, a traditional fortification um, and um, and this this private availability of guns was the same in Scotland as in e as in England, in France, and elsewhere. Just maybe uh, less in you know in relative terms, but still consistently and documented. Uh, we uh, know that a general council held in 1456 actually advised that certain uh, Scottish barons should be asked to provide quote cartes of wear um, for the Royal Army, each with two breech-loading guns, were the normal time. Um, so, 
th this is you understand at, at this point artillery was something quite uh, you know rough it was mo we made videos of how artillery began to gradually integrate uh, things like trebuchet etc the, the older artillery is a gun powder artillery uh, with the counterweight artillery let's put it in this way um, eventually taking over but it was never like a full mechanic it, it took centuries before it happened right so the thing here was bringing in as much firepower as you could so that during sieges everybody would, would shoot them right they had ridiculous uh, reloading time they often broke down as a matter of fact the same King James II of Scotland was killed by a gun backfiring at the siege of Roxburgh Castle in 1460 so that kind of exemplifies the, the, the situation um, but it's important because you know first of all also the fact they were mounted on carts made them more mobile and so we don't have to underestimate already at this point some some relevant uh, field use at the same time it was still largely you know, uh, artillery per se would never be decisive um, but it was still kind of an arm that appears on, even in pitch battles um, we also have a, a Scottish Parliament of 1471 similarly ordering prelates and barons because the clergy of course had its own you know arms as well to make such quote cartes of wear uh, which I presume also at some level have to do not just with guns uh, but also with a general support for the army logistically uh, you know an army consumes an awful lot of, of resources so as you see in this more we are in older say more modern times but still of course for larger armies uh, you, you need a, a really big amount of supplies that you have to carry you know in a way or in another all right this can be uh, the broader idea we, we skipped a little bit the infantry because that is better explained maybe through battles and so on so uh, infantry here has also a story on its own as we were seeing at the beginning of the video I'd say Scottish infantry. I never, I honestly never studied Scottish infantry too much in after the the mid 14th century uh, to test properly how Scottish warfare changed, um, by which measure, because all uh, European warfare changed after that, and so to properly um, perceive consistently how much. Uh, even in Scotland, what what happens all over Europe in terms of contraction of infantry power occurred at that point. We can we have seen it indirectly here through the uh, you know to the rise of men at arms from forms of uh, similar to the the indenture, the bands or bonds of retinue. Um, also, the spread of artillery in a sense is is part of this because we see that uh, artillery is owned by the elite. We're talking about uh, the monarchy, the the noblemen. The, even the the higher clergy and so on so um, it's obvious that here you don't see much around the you know as an actor the infantry of the commoners the, the freemen that arguably now also were less free than before of course and uh, by but by the early 14th century we know of course that the Scottish armies were quite quite strong in, in infantry given the you know the European average, and this, and this, of course, reflected, uh, if anything, numerically, right? In part, it was, of course, primarily moral strength, but they were fighting for something that even, you know, was was um, advantageous for them. Uh, there are some interesting um, details. I don't remember whether it was a Bannock burn or maybe the day before. Uh, the or a hell no I don't remember what it was but in any case uh, you see Scottish army advancing for example on the rear of the of the army to counter uh, an enemy uh, encirclement which is quite interesting because normally infantry at that time had by the early 13th century for the first time not much just the guts but properly the, the capacity because that had already been proven elsewhere but the capacity to stop heavy cavalry um, in these areas of which Scotland is one of and but normally this was a passive static thing it was a defense um, so the the problem was you can easily see it and the Scots had a bit the same problems right you can see them in Flemish armies as well first of all they had very well protected by some natural obstacle 
marshes, um, brooks, things like these. But usually, because that was aimed at the defense, but sometimes you find them advancing and advancing without losing cohesion. At least in the Scottish case, I've met it. In the Flemish case, I haven't quite met it. I mean, they did it, but they lost cohesion because they, at that time, the infantry didn't have enough training for it. Um, and um, so instead, you find some Scottish infantry acting autonomously like that and blocking. Uh, you know, successfully also an, an enemy. I presume their cavalry also came in support. Um, the other known similar thing here I met was was an Italian contingent did the same thing, and eventually cavalry managed to break through again, through them. Uh, but it's still remarkable because for the time there is none of that. You have to wa await for the Swiss in the mid 15th century, and and as far as I know, there wasn't. Um, at least by the by the fifth in, in the same fifteenth century, um, any kind of real reform of the Scottish infantry on the on the Scottish uh, oh, excuse me on this Swiss model. Um, if not, I don't know. We should I should look mostly at Scott Renaissance armies because those are you know at some point it happened like all European infantry at some point that the pikemen would be drilled in a very heavy consistent fashion. But Scotland kind of lagged a bit behind. I mean, e e even England after the Wars of the Roses wasn't very updated uh, in, in that sense, didn't rely much on on pikemen more than, say, what the Imperials did or what the, uh, the fact the Swiss, the Spanish did. But they... Mm, so in Scotland, you, you in order to do that, you, you require a strong state. And so in Scotland, this was not quite the case. And so... M the, the, a more traditional way of infantry would remain, albeit, of course, pikemen were always there. As a matter of fact, the distinction is not pikemen and or, and or their presence, because that had always been there. Of course, also the early 14th century Scottish infantry were pikemen, because that's the only thing you can have in the front ranks to block cavalry, right? You don't can't, you can't do it without, without weapons. That's the only thing that works. The important is how m drill, how much you drill you have to maneuver on the battlefield to advance, to attack aggressively, which is, again, only what the Swiss begin to do uh, from a very peculiar background that we have ex began to explain recently um, in some video. Um, whereas there is also, in fact, as we were saying since the beginning of the video, this, uh, you know, more traditional character of Scottish warfare that was reflected in some customs, in some fighting styles, even in some equipment, right? Um, with this, uh, you know, maybe in fact greater individual mm, endurance capacity. Let's put it in this way: not even necessarily a higher training on our, if not unless we are not looking properly at the elite of, of the Highlands, something like that. But I mean, this idea of being more acquainted with with a rough lifestyle uh, with you know the hardships of you know the the, the land the weather the, the also the, the political instability this kind of cattle raiding mostly you can see also in Ireland etc would make maybe the average person a bit more aware of what what war was in a more direct sense this of course has nothing to do with collective training however that is the single most important thing it makes an army and its effectiveness and um and uh and so that that's another thing uh in any case for now we stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time